Okay, I've seen Maxine twice. I've already given my spoiler-free thoughts on the movie. So let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about all them spoilers. All right, like I already mentioned, welcome to the spoiler review for Maxine. Now, this is gonna be a long video, so if you're not really into long YouTube videos, then you might wanna click away from this because I'm gonna go through essentially the entire movie, beat by beat, give my thoughts on essentially every scene in the movie. I'm gonna talk about some of the little hints that we get throughout the movie on who the killer might be, and really just everything in the movie. So. Let's just get right into it. I'm, I have some notes over here as well. I'm going to be kind of bouncing back and forth. And like I said, giving my thoughts on everything in the movie. So the movie begins in 1959. We're starting out. We see like this kind of home video right away. And uh, we hear the preacher and we got little Maxine there. And uh, her dad is essentially saying things like, that's my little girl. You're going to be the star of the church one day. And what do we always say? And then, of course, the line that we know, if you're familiar with the uh, the trilogy, I will not accept a life I do not deserve. He kind of cuts her off and says, preach it like you mean it or it won't come true. And we get a little hint there right away on kind of just more about like their relationship because her dad, the preacher, hasn't been in the trilogy a lot. You know, essentially he was just in X and uh, we saw some of him. We kind of got a little hint on what their relationship might have been like his involvement in the community um, and just what kind of person he is, what he does for work, obviously, and that he might be pretty damn radical in a lot of ways. So right away, we're in 1959. Like I said, we see young Maxine and then boom, we cut to six years later, 1985. So the events in X happened in 1979. So yeah, like I said, now we're in 1985. And so, you know, some people would have been pretty damn traumatized by what happened in X. Obviously, a lot of stuff went down. A lot of people got killed. There was just a crazy amount of things happening to Maxine's character. But for Maxine, now she's gotten to this point now in Maxine, you know, six years later, where those events actually have made her even more driven to this point, even more ambitious, which we'll see throughout Maxine that kind of unfold. And at the end of X, she's driving away. She does some more coke. She drives away after running over Pearl's head. And essentially now Maxine is just all in. There's nothing holding her back. Um, and now she's going to just try to manifest while she's in the car and from here on out, manifest all those dreams that she's been talking about for all this time, which, um, you know, also bleeds into Maxine as a movie, as a, as a whole, essentially. Like, we're seeing this movie, in my opinion, really through Maxine's eyes. There's some things in Maxine. It's weird saying Maxine and Maxine because the movie's called that. But we're seeing uh, in the movie Maxine things really through her eyes. There's a lot of things in this movie that, you know, might be just from her perspective, where in reality in the movie might have been a little bit different. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But really quickly, I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to the newest tier three patron, Aaron, for early access to videos, commentary tracks to play alongside your favorite movies, movie watch along parties with me and so many other things. Head over to Patreon where you can join for as little as $1 a month and help support the Madhouse. The link is in the description. All right, I'll shut up now and we'll get back to the video. Yes. We now cut to 1985. The doors open. We're on like the studio lot and Maxine walks in for an audition. And she's, you know, she sits down. You've got like, you know, the casting director, the director of the movie, somebody else, you know, involved, maybe a producer, whatever. I don't really know. But she's starting to get questions kind of about her history. She's walking in all confident like Maxine would. And they're like, you know, just kind of peeling back her history a little bit. You know, she's got the, uh, obviously the background in porn. Um, they're like, you know, why? Uh, questions just about, you know, have you always wanted to be in porn? What have you always wanted to do? And once again, we get reminded that Maxine, you know, has, uh, that wasn't her goal, right? Her goal was essentially to be a star. She always wanted to do bigger and better things, which now obviously she's trying to audition. She's trying to be in quote unquote legitimate movies. And she just reminds them, I've always wanted to be a star. That's just what, I, however I need to do it, whatever I need to do, I just have wanted to be a star, which is something that probably resonated with the director, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But 
And then we get reminded of more of the Hollywood vibe. Also, of course, we've gotten some 80s stuff right away. We're getting that great vibe. Um, a little bit of that, uh, actually not a lot so far, but a little hint of that. But, and then they're like, uh, you know, very robotic. They're like, okay, take off your shirt. Uh, can we see your breasts? And she's like, okay. She's used to that whole thing, but reminds you again that, you know, this isn't gonna be so touchy feely. This isn't like a heart to heart conversation that they're having here. Even though they're asking you about your background, what you've always wanted to do. It's definitely a transactional thing. You know what I mean? They want to see if you fit the part because if you don't next, and that's kind of what it is. Um, and then of course, like we get a little bit more of a reminder on who Maxine is and what she has become six years later when she says stuff like she walks by the other girls outside of the, uh, the hangar. That's essentially kind of what it is. It's like a hanger. She walks by the other girls, looks at him and she says, she says, y'all might as well go home because I just fucking nailed that. And the other girl's like, oh, damn. They're not used to this type of a person probably in Hollywood. Yeah, they're probably used to some pretty cutthroat people. But Maxine is just built different. This girl's been through some shit, which we'll definitely talk about more, of course. But yep, more of an indication of that. And then the music kicks. Give Me All Your Lovin' by ZZ Top kicks in. Great 80s vibes. Of course, Maxine gets in her Mercedes SL drop top. An incredible damn car. Love cars, but so anytime I see a great car in a movie, that's a plus. Uh, but it fits, you know, fits her character. Just works great with the whole vibe of what she's going for. And then the opening credits start. And then during the opening credits of the movie, it talks. We're kind of getting these news uh, flashes, interviews, clips. You know, Ronald Reagan shows up. But a lot of stuff here talking about censorship in media, which is a big theme throughout the movie. Of course, during the filming of the movie, you know, that we talk about a little bit later, uh, there's people protesting. But this was a big era for um, just censorship of some of the things, some of the, you know, some of the words that are being said in not only uh, music, but in movies and, and other things, which is going to come up, of course, as a huge, huge theme at the end of the movie, which we'll talk about more. So, um, and then we follow Maxine as she's getting to her day job, which, you know, nothing better than a nice Sunday brunch at an old strip club, right? Gotta love that. It says Sunday brunch, you know, come on in. But that's, uh, we're kind of seeing where she works now. And it's kind of the same old, same old, right? It's reminding you of X. It's reminding you of a similar crowd that she used to hang out with. And, uh, yeah, she's doing what she, uh, what she's used to doing and how she can make some decent money to pay the bills while she's trying to go after, go after her real dream, right? Um, and then walks by like a porn shoot, and then the girl from the porn shoot comes in where Maxine's like doing her makeup and stuff like that and asks her if she wants to hit a party in the hills tonight. And we're reminded again by uh, of Maxine's drive in that moment. She's talking about, you know, the girl says, there's gonna be a load of rich guys there, a hint on, you know, what later happens, of course, but she's kind of being lured to the hills and uh, Maxine reminds her that she's all business. And, you know, we're reminded again of like her ambition. You know, she's not going to let anything get in the way. And she declines, you know, talks about how she has to work. She's got to get up early, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So and then, um, you know, Maxine, uh, uh, yeah, she takes a phone call. Her agent says, you know, you want the good news, or the bad news, blah, 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 blah. And then we cut to the movie store which um, is one of the first parts in the movie that feels a little like meta in a way, like a little Scream-like, of course, like Randy and Scream working at the, the video store. Definitely reminds me of that right away. So yeah, we're at the video store. Maxine's kind of seeming really excited. She's got some good news to share with her friend Leon, who we meet in this moment, who works at the video store, is like a huge movie fan, knows everything about movies. Like I said, very Randy inspired from Scream in some ways. And then uh, Maxine says, name five celebrities who got their start in horror movies. And then he lists off some of them. And she says, also, Maxine fucking Minx. And then we find out that she got the part in Puritan 2, you know, which, of course, is like a, you know, a sequel to a horror movie, which is going to be so many things to talk about later on in this video about that aspect of it, because sequels in horror movies, the directors who direct those movies, the people who are in those movies, it's an interesting thing to me because there's so many aspects of it where people are, you know, trying so hard to make 
a, an, a, an IP or a concept of a horror sequel, which in itself, you know, you're kind of working, you're swimming against the current in a way because like it's in a lot of ways hard to make a horror sequel great and really make yourself stand out as a director and an actress and all those kind of things. But you know, it can happen. But yeah, so anyways, Maxine gets the part we hear in Puritan 2 that she, you know, auditioned for that we saw in the opening. Um, and then Maxine basically just leaves and uh, she says, I like you to Leon. And Leon's like, yeah, you only like me because I'm a guy who isn't trying to fuck you. So clearly we get a, a little bit of a hint there right away that Maxine doesn't really trust anybody. You know, that's not surprising. Uh, of course, she's had a lot of stuff go down in her life. You know, everything that happened in X. And she's got her goal on one thing. She's going to keep her circle small. And especially, you know, uh, she's going to find people that she can genuinely trust and try to kind of hang on to them, and which is gonna, not going to be very many people, but Leon's one of them. And then we cut to Hollywood Boulevard right after this. Great music in this scene. Great vibes. This is really where you start to get like what Ty West is going for with the 80 feel, 80s feel in this movie. I talked about this a little bit in my spoiler free review, but this isn't going to be like Stranger Things. This isn't going to be that glossy, almost like not necessarily satirical, but almost like a, you know, fantastical kind of uh, look back to the 80s. No, this is going to be a, a Hollywood in the 80s that does have glamour and glitz but also has like a dark underbelly to it and definitely has some things that are not that glamorous where Maxine lives, where she works, the people around that area. And we see some of that in this scene. So, you know, both those aspects and uh, Maxine is basically going to her night job now. You know, she hasn't quite made it yet. You know, she just got casted in her first legitimate movie. So she's still got to work. She's going to her night job at Show World. Um, and right away, there's also a guy at Show World mopping the floor i'm like damn man what do they pay you sir that has got to be the worst job in america i'm not gonna lie but so we cut to this scene and it's like these little private rooms where you know people come and they basically just put coins in and then the screen opens up and then a girl dances and it reminds you of like maxine doesn't give a shit she'll do whatever she needs to do to pay the bills to get to where she needs to be to go to more auditions we start to get like some of the dark saxophone vibes in this scene. And we're gonna, that's gonna play later on in the movie, but gives you more like the feel that Ty West is going for. Also, like the upbeat 80s music, but also the dark kind of like, I don't wanna say like sexy, but almost, yeah, just kind of like the dark saxophone music that a lot of us remember from the 80s and the 90s in some of these movies um, right away. Um, and also kind of shows like a little bit of like a sad part of this like it kind of seems like a depressing job definitely but there's a guy there watching her putting the coin in with black gloves and right away you're like okay this doesn't seem good this guy doesn't seem like he's up to you know he's up to good here he's uh and he's starting to like act weird you don't see his face you just see the black gloves and the black outfit but he's starting to like clench his fist like he's getting frustrated like he's getting pissed off um the music starting to build here also giving us our first real hint at who the Night Stalker is, which I didn't really talk about earlier, but I think in the earlier stages of like kind of the credits and some other things, I think they mentioned the Night Stalker as well. But yes, so there's this Night Stalker in LA who's um, essentially a serial killer at this point because he's killed enough people. But yeah, this person, the music's kind of building, 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 and then he rips off the wood that's just put over the window where uh, you can watch Maxine. First real hint at who the possible killer might be. Um, so their shift is over. It's probably like who knows what hour in the morning. Maxine is waiting for her coworker outside. Not scared at all. You know, also shows what's different between her and her coworker. Her coworker comes out immediately and is like, I'm nervous with this night stalker walking around. I never want to walk to my car alone. And you can tell right away Maxine's like, I don't give a shit. You know, I'm armed. I don't care. Um, you know, I, I can handle myself. Then her friend gets in the cab, takes off, and is also heading to a, a party in the hills, which, you know, maybe that was a normal thing for people in kind of showbiz or just around Hollywood at the time. But yeah, two friends back to back going to a party in the hills. And then Maxine, of course, once again declines, says she has to get up early for work. Um, she's got some stuff to do for the new movie she got casted for. And then her friend's like, but before that, before she gets in the cab, an interesting moment that I kind of want to mention is her friend says, 
Um, I got to get a hot dog real quick so nobody sees me eat at the party. It just reminds you of like the double life or the, the what people, the life people live in Hollywood or even other places, you know, that are maybe glamorous or ritzy or where people are trying to, you know, show a, a side of them that might not be real, right? Um, she doesn't want to eat in front of people, right? Uh, it just shows you another little hint on what life is like in this type of uh, environment in Hollywood um, during that time. So, uh, yeah, and, and then she tells Maxine, yeah, I'm going to this party. It's right under the Hollywood signs. You're like, okay, all right, damn. And you have to take a gondola up to the house. Um, so yeah, her friend takes off. Maxine, like I said, declines. And then Maxine starts walking home. Kind of looks like a rougher part of town. Maxine's taken it was seemingly her usual shortcut to get home. Um, she walks by the newsstand. You see on the TVs, uh, the news anchor and the news broadcast is talking about the Night Stalker again. And I will say, like, every time we cut to the newscast in this movie, which is quite a few times, it doesn't look good to me. It looks a little too glossy. It doesn't look believable that it's something that would be played in the 80s. Of course, they show, like, real footage from the 80s, which looks great because it's genuine footage. And then they show footage that they tried to make look old. Doesn't look great. But that's just a little nitpick that I want to mention there. But yeah, Maxine's walking down and then she notices right by her apartment, the gate is actually locked this time. It has like a chain around it with a padlock. So she's like, shit, what is going on here? Barbed wire on top of it. She can't get through. She has to find a new path, but turns out somebody's been following her. Um, yeah, you can see the person's face. So right away, you know, it's probably not the Night Stalker. It's probably just some random dude up to no good. And... The guy gets closer and closer and closer. And Maxine just turns around, points her little pistol at him. And uh, yeah, great moment here. Uh, just reminds you again that Maxine is not just some prissy girl, prissy city girl in Hollywood who maybe came from a small town. You know, obviously Hollywood, there's a lot of transplants all over the place, but she's not your average girl. Like this girl is not somebody you want to fuck with. She has been through some crazy shit and she is willing to do whatever she needs to do to stay alive and just to keep herself safe. So she puts the gun at the guy and says, you know, get on your knees, right? Um, strip naked, get your ass down. Uh, tells him to essentially also like blow the pistol, you know, so he starts sucking on the pistol. Uh, you know, he's getting naked and then she says, face down, ass up. And then she asks him a question. She says, do you know what happened to the last person that tried to kill me? And I was like, I do, yeah, it was pretty bad. She said, I crushed her fucking head. And of course, you remember Pearl, you know, getting her head crushed twice by Maxine in the truck. The end of X, great scene. But, and then, bam, she smashes the guy's nuts right on the pavement. A brutal moment. His sack just explodes. You see everything. It's a gruesome moment. Um, the first time I watched the movie, there was definitely a pretty big audience reaction to that. The second time I watched the movie, um, which was pretty packed theater, a different theater, probably a different crowd. Um, wasn't, wasn't surprisingly, wasn't much of a reaction to it. I was like, oh shit. Okay. All right. That was a pretty big thing for me, but some cool gore, a fun moment and a shocking moment. No doubt. Uh, gave you a little hint of like the vibe in X, you know, where there's some of those shocking gore moments. Definitely. Um, but then right away we cut to uh, like a vulnerable moment for Maxine, which is unique in the trilogy like she doesn't have too many moments like that you know even when like she has her clothes off even when she's doing other things that would be seemingly vulnerable for some people no not for maxine but this vulnerable moment with her uh cuddling with leon on the couch um clearly also shows you like maxine's psyche she's not losing any sleep whatsoever about almost getting killed for one and then also crushing somebody's family jewels she's like man man Going right to bed, sleeping like a baby. Know what I mean? But um, yeah, so, and then the door, somebody knocks on the door. And Maxine goes out. She sees somebody like briefly, just for a second, go down the elevator. And she's like, that's weird. What is, what is this? And they left a tape at her door. So she's like, okay, that's weird. On the tape, it says for Maxine. And she puts it in right away. And she's starting to see some of the footage. It says like Texas law enforcement evidence. And then she starts to see some of the footage from X. Um, the footage that was left over from, you know, everything from the video that they were making in X. And then here outside of her apartment, we meet Kevin Bacon for the first time, the private detective. And um, he's talking to whoever's in his back seat. 
who has the black gloves, clearly the same person from Maxine's work, and says to him, you know, I've, I've, I've tracked her down for you. I've found her. I've done what you wanted me to do. So if you want more than this, the price is going to go up if you want more. That's what Kevin Bacon's character says. And then, um, yeah, like I said, we see what's on the tape a little bit. She cuts it off when Leon wakes up. And then um, we cut to Maxine early the next morning um, doing what she needed to do. She told her friend she had to wake up early to start working on the movie. And she's getting a life cast. Uh, so also a cool moment, you know, see some of the special effects, the practical effects that go on behind the scenes, making a life cast of somebody. Um, and the girl who's doing the effects for her is like, how did you get that scar? She's like, that's a gnarly ass scar. And she's like, somebody shot at me. And the girl's like, whoa, you know, clearly like not something actresses respond with, you know, it's usually like, oh, you know, I fell off my swing as a kid or something like that, but not Maxine. Maxine's got some crazy ass stories, right? So, but they put on the life cast and, uh, of course the dipshit, uh, leaves her alone. Uh, nobody in the room, this life cast covering her entire face with like silicone, uh, you know, if you're claustrophobic at all, it's probably not going to go too well. But now, Max, we're starting to see uh, the videotape kind of, once again, reminded Maxine of her past, right? She's tried to put that behind her. She's tried her best to really just set that to the side so she can focus on her goal of being somebody, making it big. But then she's brought back to her past with this tape. So when she's in the, the silicone, when she's in the life cast, it, she's starting to remember some of her trauma from X. She's having flashbacks right away. She has a flashback, flashback to Pearl saying, you'll end up just like me, you know, which is Maxine's worst nightmare. Somebody who's completely undesired, who in her opinion has accomplished nothing, accomplished nothing that she wants to at least. And just, you know, terrifying for Maxine as a character. Um, and then, yeah, Maxine falls over. The effects artist comes in, saves her. And Maxine's just like heavy breathing essentially after that. And then we cut to a cemetery where the police have found uh, Maxine's friends, coworkers, whatever you want to say, Amber and Tabby. They found their bodies in this pond at a cemetery. And here we're getting uh, our next hint at what type of a movie Ty West is going for here. He's going for... We're getting that next hint that he's going for like a more realistic 80s movie that you would actually put on in the 80s. There's going to be some things here that are not quite like up to standards. They're going to be, uh, you know, like, you know, in our cancel culture and some of the things, you know, that people don't say anymore that used to be commonplace in the 80s. You got like a cop who says something that's kind of like a homophobic sort of term in a way, something that you don't really see in movies nowadays, which reminds you what Ty West is going for. Um, the, the, one of the dudes who's there is like, you know, it says something that immediately reminds me of Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Uh, Axel, the guy, the coroner, who's like, oh, pretty girl. And they're like, was. And he says, still is. And then this guy in Maxine is like, pretty girls, you hate to see it, you know? Um, so that's something that reminds you of 80s slashers, 80s movies, once again, is reminding you like, okay, Ty West is going for that tone. You know what I mean? This is going to be, it's going to have some things in here that's going to feel like an 80s cop movie in some ways. Murder mystery. So yeah, and then uh, these the two girls are dead, clearly, and they're both marked. They look gnarly. They're marked with like this sign, this like devil sign, a cult sign, whatever you want to call it, right? Which we'll talk about more of the details on that sign later, but right away as an audience, if you're not familiar with the sign, um, then uh, you're just going to think, okay, they just put some weird sign on them, right? And then um, we cut to, so Maxine shows up to the lot uh, to do some more stuff for work and she meets her, like maybe a production assistant or something like somebody who works on the set, a lower level person on the set who warns her about the director and, uh, and says like, hey, I've seen this director blow a gasket on people. You know, be careful, tread lightly, right? Um, so, you know, Maxine's already starting, things are starting to build up for Maxine. She's already got a little bit of stress, I'm sure, from starting her big break potentially in Hollywood. Now the tape from her past is coming up. Uh, you know, it's just like, okay, things are starting to starting to pile up here. The stress is starting to happen here for her. There's a lot going on. And then she finds a note on her the window of her car too. And, uh, you know, it's got some stuff written on it. It's got a phone number written on it. And, and if I remember correctly, it says like for a good time, call this number or something. I can't remember, but 
Um, and then we see more protesters at the studio protesting the movie, you know, violence in movies, horror movies, et cetera, just in general. So yeah, Maxine calls the number um, and the person on the phone uh, basically says, meet me at this hotel. Um, you need to be there, blah, blah, blah. And then ends it with Miss Miller. And Maxine knows right away, not only along with the tape, but now this person's using her real last name. So he's like, okay, she's like, okay, this is not good. Somebody knows who I am. Somebody's tracking me for some reason. Something's going on here. And then we cut to the scene with Kevin Bacon's character. So yeah, then we see the high rise building that she's going to have lunch in. And then she goes and has lunch with John Labatt, Kevin Bacon's character, John, the private detective. And immediately you're getting great vibes from John Labatt, from Kevin Bacon's character. Has just the right amount of sleaze to him. Feels very much like what you would imagine a 1980s private detective would be. You know what I mean? He's got a couple gold teeth. Just, I mean, I, I love Kevin Bacon. He's a great actor. I love, I'm such a big fan of his for so many years, ever since Tremors when I saw that in 1990 as a kid. But anyways, his character's great in this movie. And he's just doing such a good job of showing Maxine that, hey, you know, like I'm working for somebody here. Like, you know, you and I both are, you know, into some dirty shit. You know, we're not really the most upstanding people in the world, but we got a job to do. You know what I'm saying? And ultimately the person that I'm working for, you're going to have to answer to, you know, and, and if he wants consequences, then no, you know, it's nothing personal. It's going to have to happen. So, and yeah, so he has lunch with Kevin Bacon's character, which is great. Love the interaction between the two of them. I just think it's funny. Maxine plays it very coy, keeps the cards close to her chest, doesn't say too much. And, uh, but Kevin Bacon's character, character John gives us some great lines here. He says stuff like the past ain't finished with you, Maxine. It's going to keep knocking at your door until you let it in because Maxine is just essentially denying everything he's saying. Um, sort of, she's hinting a little bit on maybe she had some involvement. She's like, uh, you know, I didn't do anything, but if I did, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and then, uh, John says, uh, tells her about a soiree tonight. He says, the man that he's working for, she needs to go to this soiree or else. You know, and then Maxine says, well, what if I don't go? And he says, well, you know how the old saying goes, I'll never work in this town again. Okay. So Maxine doesn't like that too much because, you know, she's got a goal in mind and obviously she just got casted to be in her first movie. Um, and then she, you know, John leaves, Kevin Bacon kind of walks away. He's just so like, he's perfect for this role because he's at a great age for this role. He's gangly enough. You know, his suit's oversized like it would be in the 80s. He just looks the part to the T. It's great. But anyways, yeah, so he hands him the envelope with the address of the place she needs to go to on it. And she's op she opens it up and it's got a news article in there. It says, the Texas Porn Star Massacre. So Maxine's immediately like, oh, damn. Yeah, this would not be good. And John's character also reminds her, it says, like, contrary to popular belief, you know, there is such a, you know, there is such a thing as bad press. So, yep. Maxine gets back to her apartment then after this. And this is when she meets the police for the first time. They're there. Um, they know that she works with the two girls who were killed. And they just want to get some information from her. They're trying to do it you know, in a sly little way. Hey, we'll just come up to your apartment real quick. Five minutes, you know, no big deal. And then of course they'll snoop around obviously, right? But Maxine knows better than this. She's not just your average girl who's living in Hollywood. She's like I said, been through some shit. She knows. And she says, I don't talk to cops, right? Um, and then, yeah, after this, she goes back down and talks to Leon uh, and wants to find out where the tape was made. And I like Leon's character. Uh, he's kind of a throwaway character in a lot of ways. This was his first movie, actually, the actor. Um, so props to him. I think he did a good job in the movie, and I think he fits well in the movie and has some good chemistry with Maxine's character. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, clearly plays that Randy type of a character in this movie. Gives you a little bit of that meta kind of stuff, which is fun. I enjoy it. But yeah, anyways, asks him and says like, hey, can you find out maybe who made this tape, where it came from, track it down? And he gives her a spiel about, you know, the possibilities and stuff like that. And then she just says, peace. And, um, yeah. And then she, Maxine heads back to the lot to meet up with the director. And, um, uh, she does, she meets up with the director, the director picks her up in a golf cart and the director just starts, you know, this is where we get more of like who this director is. 
Uh, definitely, you know, the director right away gives her a spiel about like how the producers didn't want her in a movie because she's a former porn star, how that would affect, uh, negatively affect the movie. And then, uh, you know, points at some more of just kind of the hypocrisy in movie making. It's like, okay, you don't want a porn star in your sequel to a satanic horror movie. Come on. Which we even see in real life a lot of that hypocrisy that happens in filmmaking you know what i mean so yes meets the director and uh you're getting to kind of know this director the actress is great in this movie um but yeah the director is funny she's kind of like shakespearean she's very thoughtful she's everything that she says is very eloquent and very well thought out and measured in a lot of ways in a sense um just about everything but yeah, yeah, she's but she's kind of acting. You know, she's she's saying this is potentially my break too. I want to really put my name on this movie. You can't screw this up for me. And she asks Maxine. She says, "Are you ruthless?" And Maxine goes, "Yes, ma'am." And me, I'm like sitting there. I'm like, "Oh yeah, if you only knew how ruthless Maxine really is." Like she's probably thinking that she's giving her a cliche answer, but you bet your ass she actually really is. And this is, of course where they next stop at, make a little pit stop at the Psycho set, which is, you know, it fits into the story somewhat because it plays in later on with uh, John's character and Maxine, of course, which we'll talk about in a second. But I'm sure uh, for Ty West, he was just like, you know what I mean? This was probably just a wet dream for him, like it would have been for me. You know, gets the chance to film something at the Psycho set. Might as well do it, right? So they do. They stop at the Psycho set. But Maxine's starting to see, like, the trauma is starting to come back again, like it did when she was making the life cast. She's starting to see Pearl up in the window of the Psycho set, which is very fitting for not only Psycho for the movie, but if you remember X, everything that goes on in that. It's very fitting to see Pearl in that window as well, and just the sinister aspect of Pearl. So Maxine's really starting to daze off and stare at the set, and not she's not listening to the director at all. Um, and the director is essentially telling her like, hey, Maxine, I want you to visit the set later. Um, we're going to film a flashback scene. I would love you to be there. I'd love you to meet some of the people, et cetera, et cetera. And says, hey, Maxine, like, listen up. Like, you're not listening at all. And says again, like, I'm trying to prove myself on this movie. I'm not trying to make a shitty sequel to a horror movie, right? So, you know, and then gives a great quote that I actually really liked. Uh, the director says, talks about like, you've made it to the belly of the beast now, you know, but... If you screw this up, you know, he might not have a taste for you after he spits you out to kind of eat you again. But you've made it to the belly of beast, belly of the beast. Don't mess this up. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And then um, we cut to Maxine leaving and Kevin Bacon's now following her in the car, filming her. So for some reason, Kevin Bacon is now filming her. He's kind of documenting what she's up to, what she's doing in Hollywood, you know, the direction that she's taking with her life and her career and just what she's doing. You know, he's trying to document that, which will play into a big theme and a big, you know, kind of moment later on in the movie. So, and once again, reminded that Maxine, you know, not somebody to fuck with. So Maxine gets out of the car, is like, hell no. Gets right out of the car, puts the keys into her hand. You got the keys sticking out of the knuckles. And she's like, all right. And just starts wailing on him. It was a little corny though. I'm not going to lie. Like how robotic if you go back and watch that scene again how robotic her arm was you know it didn't really look realistic like she was punching but a little bit of a nitpick there but beats the shit out of kevin bacon's character john and john is like just all bloody she kicks his window while she's leaving she's like don't do that again you know he's all bloody and he's like now you made this personal this is now personal so the relationship between them two you know just quickly goes south which is going to be very evident for the rest of, you know, John's character arc in this movie. You know, shit went down. And just reminds you again, like, Maxine, you know, at times can, you know, can kind of blow a gasket, you know, in moments where she should have maybe been a little bit more democratic maybe about it. You know, sometimes she just doesn't really care. And uh, she's going to remind you, she don't fuck with her. So, yeah. Uh, Maxine now is like, shit, like a lot of stuff's going on here. This is messing with my mind. This is messing with my first opportunity in Hollywood. I got to go see my agent. I got to go see him. So she goes and visit, visits her, her agent, uh, Teddy Knight, great character in the movie. 
Great actor, too. I forget how to pronounce his name, but he's a great actor. You've seen him in a lot of things. Obviously, plays one of the villains in Breaking Bad. He's in one of the Star Wars spinoffs. Yeah, great actor. Um, love him in this movie. He's really, really good. And she sits down with him, goes busts through the, uh, the secretary and is like, um, asks him if there's, you know, they have lawyer confidentiality. And she basically, we don't get to see it, but she tells him what happened in the movie X and what's currently going on. Someone's tailing her. And right away, you get the vibe from Teddy that he's like very much a, 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 like a warm, like fatherly figure to her like a pretty damn good agent. He's coming across that way, at least. He's selling us on it, I feel like, in my seat as I'm watching. Um, definitely seems like he wants to help her because, I mean, it's a good like situation because if she does well, it's going to be great for him. He's not only going to make more money if she makes more money and gets more roles, et cetera, et cetera. So it's in his best interest to keep all the shit that's going on that's distracting her from breaking into Hollywood away from her, right? So yeah, great scene there with Teddy. I loved that. And then, yeah, we cut to Maxine in her bed. She's working on her lines now. She's got the script for Puritan 2. She's highlighting on the lines. But there's something else going on. It's nighttime. We cut to the video store. And now you're starting to get the vibe that Leon uh, might be into some trouble now. He's closing up the store, which is a trope, definitely, uh, and usually means that uh, something might go down here. So we see Leon, somebody comes into the store and Hey, there's some sort of an interaction. We don't hear what's said or what's really done. There's somebody off screen and he's like, Hey, we don't, he's like, we don't, we don't do that at the store anymore. Um, somebody in the comments can probably correct me and tell me what exactly he was probably hinting at in that store. I mean, there's a lot of things I can think of, but, um, yeah, he was essentially like, we don't do that in the store anymore. I mean, I'm sure it's something dirty. He's like, we're just a video store now, blah, 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 blah. So yeah. Maxine's working on her lines, and uh, yeah, Leon gets fucked up. Somebody you see as he's closing the store is creeping right behind him, and right away, it's not a throat slit, though. It's a neck slit on the back of the neck, and it looks gnarly. The guy slices right across his neck. So you can see some of the muscle kind of sticking out, and it's just right away a nasty, nasty cut. This is where the movie goes into that slasher type of a vibe without a doubt. I mean, of course, it's very obvious, right? <clears throat> and then Leon gets sliced right down the eye, also kind of a nasty thing. Great effects there, enjoyed that. Gets stabbed in his cast on his arm and then just gets you know slashed in to all hell and gone, right? And this moment uh, was, uh, I think, shot in a fun way. I liked it. We had some zoom-ins here with, uh, with this kill. Uh, felt very much actually like Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning, you know, Fake Jason, that movie, where they use a lot of those like kind of cheesy 80s zoom-ins on a lot of the kills, which is fun for me. Uh, definitely feels very 80s. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the whole Giallo stuff. I don't feel knowledgeable enough to talk about that yet. I haven't done enough research or seen enough of those movies to really talk about it. So I'm going to leave that to the side. Uh, but I know the gloves in this movie are inspired by that, uh, the black gloves and stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, this is yeah very much a slasher scene. You know, get some good blood here and some you know, some fun moments. And uh, I mean, Leon's character is cool, but it sucks to see him get killed. Uh, but still a fun kill uh, regardless. So, um, but this moment, one of the key moments with Leon's kill, though, is it really gives us the next hint on who the killer is, if you pay attention closely. So you see the moment right after he gets killed. It zooms in on his necklace that's on his ear, which is a cross. So you see the person with the gloves who killed him kind of picks up the necklace for a second, examines it just for a second, you know, examines the cross, and then boom, just rips it off. That's your next hint on who the killer is in the movie. So pay attention to that. Yeah, and then uh, Maxine gets a call from her agent again, kind of giving her a rundown on maybe who the private detective is, how he's really good at covering up his tracks. This guy's a professional. He knows what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. But that gets interrupted because there's cops downstairs that interrupt the call. There's like a kind of a crowd circling. Cops are arriving. Clearly something went down. So we cut to then Maxine runs downstairs to see what happened at the video store. And she's like, this is not good. And then the two detectives who tried to talk to her earlier are there because they're in the homicide unit and um, they're starting to wheel out Leon and they're looking at Maxine. They want to see her reaction, you know, and they do something that they probably shouldn't have done. But to see her reaction, they pull up, you know, the um, 
They pull up the sheet over his head and to see kind of how she reacts. Of course, she freaks out. They have to hold her back. She's freaking out, doing that whole thing. And it shows you again, like, this is not a moment. You don't very often see Maxine react this way to a death. You could definitely tell this is possibly the only person in this world that she's close to, genuinely. This is her only genuine friend, potentially. The other people, the other two girls who got killed might have just been co-workers that she didn't vibe all that much with. But this is a character she was willing to be vulnerable with. So she kind of freaks out when he gets killed, which is surprising to see Maxine do something like that, you know? Um, yeah, so now um, we cut to the morgue and Maxine is there. She's ready to kind of sort of open up a little bit with the cops. Um, but, you know, the male cop, the dude kind of freaks out, starts yelling at her what she's hiding. She can tell she's hiding something, which obviously we know she is, of course. Um, and then... Eventually, Maxine leaves, and one of the cops is like, hey, like you got to help us. We don't want somebody else to get killed. You're going to help save a life if you give us some good information. And Maxine's like, they're on their own. They need to save their own life like I did, and then walks out. But this makes her late. I mean, assumingly late. It makes her late for the flashback scene that she was supposed to go to with the director. So... Yeah, she shows up late for the flashback scene. The director's like, she tries to apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm so sorry. And the director's like, please just stop. Stop. I, if you try to tell me any excuses, this is going to make my day even worse. And he's like, okay, this is your last warning. And you get another hint on like how it is making movies, what the life is like in Hollywood, how cutthroat it is. You know what I'm saying? Because she's like, if you do this again, this is your last warning. I'll have the second best girl waiting um, you know, frothing at the mouth to take your position. So just a reminder, this might be your only break you get in your entire life. So don't fuck it up. So just another reminder of like the whole Hollywood aspect of this movie, right? And then after that whole thing, you know, we get the whole thing with the movie. We see some of like what goes on to making, you know, the flashback scene, which is kind of fun. And then we cut to um, Maxine having a chat with the girl who's in the first Puritan movie, who's there filming the flashback scene. Her name's Molly in the movie. We cut to that. Uh, Maxine's having a little chat with her, you know, um, and um, Molly's giving her some advice about working with the director. And she's just saying, like, she's great. Just follow everything she says. She's great. She knows her shit. Just follow everything she does. It'll all pay off. She'll, you'll get more jobs because of it. She got this job because she was loyal to her, et cetera, et cetera. Giving her some advice. You're like, oh, that's cool. Like somebody's actually trying to help her and seems kind of genuine. A little bit and then also gives you like a little bit of a hint on what life is like being a working actress she's like you know i haven't quite made it yet but at least my health care won't expire right that's nice and then she says like well i gotta get running you know that kind of thing because she was also invited to a party in the hills but this time it's a little bit different it's not some rich guy like the other girl said it's not like a surgeon like the other girl said which i didn't really talk about this time she just says it's some out of town producer. So a lot of people being invited to the Hollywood Hills party. So obviously you'll find out later on in the movie what that's all about. But an important moment there, of course. And um, and then when she says bye to Maxine, she calls her Nadine. So once again, brings you back around, reminds you about Hollywood, about L.A., about the industry. And is like, OK, she seemed really, really genuine, but. You know, in the end, didn't even know her name. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, if this was real life, I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's really not much to, like, think about because, shit, I, I miss people's names all the time. It's impossible to remember every name. I get it. But it's a specific, basically every line and every frame in Ty West's movies are very intentional so that, you know, there's something to talk about with uh, her messing up that name, of course. Yeah, so next we uh, cut to... um she finished meeting with Molly and then she's walking across uh, one a different set where they're filming maybe like a Western or something. There's there's horses and then runs into Kevin Bacon and Kevin Bacon's like, OK, here we go. You know, I I, I, I guess he was going to try to kill her, capture her. I, I don't really know. But they have a chase scene with Ke with Kevin Bacon, which to me, maybe a little drawn out. Still fun, though, kind of shows you like some more of who Kevin Bacon's character is. John, you know, gangly. Uh, kind of an older guy, you know, is trying to keep up with a young Maxine, you know, kind of hard at the same time, but it's fun. And then, of course, it ends at the psycho set 
And uh, Maxine goes into the set. Uh, you see inside that it's not, you know, the inside is not the same as the movie. It's just a facade on the outside, which is always fun to see, like, what really goes on with that. And then Kevin Bacon gets picked up by a security guard and taken out of the lot, which saves Maxine, I guess, in a way. Like I said, I don't know if he was going to kill her or not. It seemed like he was going to kill her. He was talking about he was going to kill her. So maybe he was just going to shoot her. But um, but yeah, and then he um, runs into the director again just for a second. And the director has a moment, you know, without like the whole set being there to kind of just um, talk to her a little bit about her being late. Tells her again, like, please don't screw up my mo movie. Don't mess this up. And says, you know what? We're not filming anything this weekend. We got nothing really going on. So I don't know what's going on in your life, but take the weekend off. Take the weekend off. Do what you got to do. Party, relax, whatever you need to do. And it just reminds her, says, hey, you know, like, whatever's interfering with this picture, just do whatever you need to do to squash it. And Maxine's like, yep, I will. And once again, as an audience, you're like, if you only knew that Maxine genuinely means that, she will do literally anything. So, uh, yeah, she is not kidding. And the next scene only reminds you and just nails that home. So Maxine gets ready, gets that cool makeup on, you know, like with the red around the eyes. Badass. I, mean, I think that's pretty iconic for Maxine's character. It looks great. But anyways, she goes, she's getting ready to go out and party, right? Seemingly as an audience, you just think she's okay. She's going to cut loose a little bit. That's a little different for Maxine, right? She's going to not wake up early. She's not going to work on her lines. She's actually going to go out and just have fun. No, that's not what's going to happen here. Maxine has a purpose. This has this, this is important for her career. You know what I mean? This is a key moment to continue her climb towards becoming somebody. So she goes to the club and Kevin Bacon follows her, which is exactly what she wanted. He follows her into the bathroom. She climbs out through a window. Kevin makes like, oh shit, goes back around. And then uh, a car, like the car lights shine in Kevin Bacon's eyes. Somebody comes up behind Kevin Bacon, knocks his ass out. It was all just a trap for private detective John. So yes. So, and then John wakes up and um, he's in he's there at like a a junkyard and his car is in a car crusher like one of those car crushers and he's like oh shit this is not good before that though he was willing to talk some smack he was he spits at maxine you know whatever whatever and then once this thing starts squishing though he's like oh damn uh-oh you know he starts saying his prayers he starts pleading for his life and i remember the first time i saw this scene i was kind of there was definitely a part of me that was like Oh, maybe they're just trying to get some information out of him. Her agent, Teddy, is there. The guy who was actually, uh, I think he was even, I think he was directing the porn at the beginning of the movie, uh, uh, was also there. He's like a really big guy. He was also there as well. He's got like two two dogs, um, two uh, like Dobermans with him or something like that. But anyways, there's a part of me who's like, okay, they're probably not going to crush him because they're just wanting to get some information out of him, right? But no. And then once it starts going lower and lower, I was like, oh, no, no, they just actually want to kill him because they just that's going to help a lot with what she's doing. Like this guy is ruining her potential like chance at making it. So, yeah, kill him. And Teddy's like, yeah, let's do this. He'll do whatever he needs to do. You know, so, yeah, Teddy, like shit. I mean, like best agent in the business. You know what I mean? Damn. So, yeah, Kevin Bacon's character, John. Gets crushed in his car. A juicy moment. A fun little kill. Uh, like, uh, with the blood just pouring out of the bottom of the door of the car. That was a cool little thing. Um, the second watch, I was trying to notice the cut to see how they filmed it. If there was a fake person in there or not. But it, it kind of seemed like uh, there was a real person in there. And then it cut at the last moment to a different shot. But I, I don't know. Um, it was kind of hard to tell, but a cool moment. I thought it was done well and uh, pretty sinister for sure. And then we cut back to uh, Maxine's apartment again. And now she's like, okay, I'm done with that shit. And oh, I forgot to say, Teddy and the other guy, are like, don't even worry about it. We'll take care of everything. We'll clean it up. You just go do what you need to do to be the best you can in this movie. Once again, best agent in the business. Come on now, Teddy. But yeah, then the dogs like go over and start licking the blood and all that kind of stuff, which I guess was a part of the cleanup. Pretty good idea. But yeah, back to Maxine's apartment. So we go back to Maxine's apartment. She's, she like 
wads up the envelope with the address to the soiree she was supposed to go to that was going to be like life or death for her, throws it in the trash, walks away, comes back, picks it up and is like, you know what? Because there was a news broadcast on as well talking about uh, another girl got killed by the Night Stalker. And then she has a flashback back to when the cops, when to the female cop tells her like, you could save a life if you just give us some help, give us some information. So she picks back up the address and uh, is now convinced that she wants to do something about it. She wants to confront whoever this person is, whatever's going on, whoever hired the private investigator, uh, she's going to confront this person and, and go to this address and see what's going to happen here. You know what I mean? So it's in the Hollywood Hills. She heads to the house and yep, surprise, surprise, there's a gondola. Pretty badass. This house is under the Hollywood sign, a fucking gondola, like kind of crazy, right? So whoever this person is, has some cash. Uh, the cops are tailing her. They're following her. They had a little stakeout at her house. So they're following her as well. Maxine goes upstairs. She lets herself in the house. It's unlocked. Whoever was there wants her to come in clearly. And then she's, she's approaching this door and hears her home video, the home video from the opening of the movie. She can hear the audio from it, you know, of her as a little kid talking and stuff. She opens up the doors and boom. It's her dad. Her dad is revealed as the guy who's been killing people with the black gloves. It's her dad from X that we see on the TV, the the, the pastor, whatever the hell you want to call him. And um, yeah, we start to get a little, immediately reminds me of Pamela Voorhees a little bit from Friday the 13th. You know, a, a, a fatherly, you know, motherly figure, a parent figure. Uh, you know, some kind of Pamela Voorhees vibes with the sinister way he's kind of talking to her, uh, definitely. But the key moment here is like her dad is like the person that can stop Maxine in her tracks. He's the person that clearly they've got a deep, deep history, you know, a dark, most likely very dark history with each other. And it's the one person who can stun Maxine. Clearly. And he says, you've been lost for far too long, darling. And she's just like frozen. She's so frozen. He just walks up, takes the pistol out of her hand and, and then tells her, he says, hey, I'm making a film and you're going to be the star. Um, and of course, from the home video, you're also getting that indication that her dad's kind of like grooming her to be the star, to take over potentially what he does. Right. We'll talk, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. Um, and then her dad starts to go into more of the themes of the movie about like w how America has been weaponizing the TV to turn the youth towards the devil and how she's been a part of that and all that kind of stuff and how he's going to, he wants to expose the devil inside of her and perform an exorcism to take it out, you know, on camera to show everyone and, um, and then Maxine's like backing up like, oh shit, she's so stunned. And then there's a staircase behind her and she like bumps a suitcase and the suitcase falls down the stairs and opens up and it's the body parts of, I think her, her name is Molly, the actress from the first Pur Puritan movie who, you know, gave her some advice and stuff like that. It's her body parts. And then, you know, falls down the stairs and then you clearly see like her head. Great pros prosthetic, by the way. Really good job, whoever did that. Looks just like her. But Kind of a crazy moment. And then while Maxine is stunned and is like, holy shit, what's going on here? Bam, we get the plastic bag moment over her head. Her dad puts the plastic bag over her face. And I'm like, oh, is he going to kill her? Like, what's going on here? But yeah, puts the plastic bag over her. And I don't care how many times you see that trope of the plastic bag. Um, it just feels so sinister. It feels so dark. It feels like such a primal kill in so many ways, you know? It, of course, it reminds me of Black Christmas, 1974, of course, but yeah, uh, kind of crazy. So, and then blacks out, we fade to black, and then we cut to Maxine, still alive. Uh, she just passed out, but this time now she's tied up to a tree in the backyard. Um, and now she's on a new film set, it's her dad's film that he mentioned. So... I will say, though, right off the bat, I was a little distracted in this scene looking at her dad because he was so damn orange. And not orange all over. I mean, we're talking like Donald Trump orange here. His face, just in particular, like right here, was just so orange and his neck was pale. I don't know. I was just kind of distracted by that for a minute. But regardless, I do digress. 
um, yeah, she's tied up against a tree. She's blindfolded. And, and then her dad is like, yeah, your friends, they wouldn't accept God's love. Um, who I forgot to mention earlier, there's a moment earlier in the movie that shows it's a video camera moment that shows her friends tied up in a closet at this house. So you see like a little glimpse of that. It doesn't show them getting killed, but that's right before they find the bodies. I forgot to mention that a little bit, but anyways, he says your friends wouldn't accept uh, God's love and they were punished by his wrath, essentially. And he says, but tonight though, not you, Maxine, tonight we're gonna perform an exorcism. We're gonna get the devil out of you, you know? Which, fine, I know for a lot of people, and we'll get into this more, the ending is a little bit in the uh, direction of, uh, we're starting to veer off into something a little different for not only this trilogy, but maybe falling off the wheels, falling off the tracks a little bit here at some moments. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. So, and then he says, uh, you know, you need to denounce your life of sin and then ask to be saved, or you get marked with the sign of the beast. That way, you know, basically everybody can see that you're a sinner and you're in with the devil because it's marked right on your fucking face, right? And especially for somebody who works in Hollywood who wants to be in movies, who, you know, is kind of like her sexiness is a big part of what she does. Not going to be a good thing, right? But yeah, right as the dad with the cattle prod is showing up to put it closer and closer to her face because Maxine doesn't want to say all that stuff. Then one of the cops shows up. The guy cop shows up and says like, put your hands up, everybody freeze, you know, that kind of a thing. So yeah, this is where the whole like ending firefight scene happens. Definitely more of like an action feel to this scene for sure, which kind of feels a little unique for a Ty West movie. It not only feels unique in this trilogy, but yeah, just in general for what Ty West does. So yeah, we get this whole firefight thing where everybody's there and it feels very 80s too. The two cops with just pistols can't see or, or easily taking out all the other people with you know, seemingly bigger guns and just more people in general, which feels very 80s, which I still like. It's still enjoyable. But yeah, anyways, her Maxine's dad gets shot in the arm, drops the little cattle prod thing and then kind of scurries off and then eventually goes up the hill around the house, up the hill and towards the Hollywood sign. Uh, Maxine cuts out which has her switchblade. I think it was the same switchblade that she stole from the dude at the beginning of the movie who was trying to kill her. So, hey, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, cuts out, cuts the rope from her arms and then gets yanked into the pool by one of her dad's, you know, pissant little guys and gets yanked into the pool. There's a little scuffle there. And then Maxine, he doesn't know she has a knife probably and just bam, shoves the knife right into the dude's nose. So that was a fun little moment there. And then, um, uh, the other cop is like, Hey, I'm going to go follow him. Uh, help is on the way. Backups on the way. And Maxine, sees one of the sawed off shotguns there, grabs it and is like, you know what? I'm coming too. So she heads up there while Maxine's kind of climbing the hill. You can hear shots up ahead, like something's going down up by the Hollywood sign with the two cops and the dad, you know, something's happening. She's trying to get up there and get up there, get up there. And then, um, and then the, the guy cop, he got shot in the whole midst of everything. He got shot. He's essentially dying there. Um, the female cop runs off and is like, I'm going to go chase him. You put some blood you know, pressure on this wound and he dies. The first cop dies. And, um, yeah. And then we had kind of a moment where definitely the first crowd, when the first time I saw this movie reacted to this moment, they were kind of laughing kind of think it's a little bit silly, but, and then Maxine, the guy dies. So she's like, all right, fuck this. I'm going to move and try to go for my dad. And then the female cop shows up. And is like, ah, ah, and she's got a cross like in her eye. And she's like, I told you I'd get him. And then she it's like trips and falls down the hill. Uh, you know, kind of a silly, ridiculous scene. I mean, I get how it, why it would happen and, and how it would happen in the whole skirmish little fight that they were probably having. But still, it, it came across a little bit silly, but I get the tone of it. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, I get how that fits into just the 80s vibe of it. Um, but yeah, Maxine approaches and her dad's on the ground. He's not in good shape. He's clearly dying He's been shot, I'm sure, multiple times or something like that. And this is a big moment in the movie, definitely, like especially, especially the exchange that she has with her dad. And then her dad starts saying things like, this was all for you. Um, you know, I tried to get you to be just like your daddy, but I created a monster because her dad was essentially trying to groom her to be like this theatrical pastor preacher, just like him, you know, in a lot of ways. And, he, and then he says stuff like, Forgive me, failing a child is the greatest sin of all. And 
Um, now there's like a, uh, there's a police helicopter that's now showing up and is shining lights on Maxine and is like, drop your weapon now, Maxine. We know what, we know who you are. Like drop your weapon. This is your last chance. Drop the weapon, which was kind of funny because they, it seemed like they kept saying, this is your last chance. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah. And then actually nothing happens. We just cut, we cut to breaking news. And then we see a news broadcast and it says the night stalker apprehended. So this is the moment, I think, for a lot of people where it also gets a little bit weird here. And it reminds me, and I could be wrong on this. This is just my thoughts. This is my theory on it. But this almost feels like Maxine is kind of daydreaming in a way, um, at least for some of this stuff. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. But yeah, we cut to it. It's like the Night Stalker has finally been apprehended. And, you know, it shows like a clip of the Night Stalker being apprehended, being put into a car. And then we cut to like, hey, and now we have an interview with Maxine Minx. And it's like Maxine sitting down with like Diane Sawyer in a sense. And it's like, Maxine, you have become quite a celebrity by taking down the serial killer who happened to be your father, you know? And she's giving like a very well thought out response, a very Hollywood response, a very normal response that you would see from somebody who's now become a celebrity, who's now become kind of like a little bit of a brand um, and things like that. And then we also cut to that red carpet moment that you've seen in some of the uh, the movie posters, that you've seen in the trailer. Uh, the crowd is like chanting Maxine, Maxine, Maxine. And it's starting to feel even more and more like theatrical, even more and more like a dream moment or at least a daydream more moment or something that you would picture as a kid when you're thinking about like, if you're a kid who was like, I wanna be famous, this is something you would think about. You would imagine yourself like walking down the red carpet, people chanting your name, people interviewing you, what kind of a answer you would give to those type of a thing, you know? And that, that that's how this feels to me in this moment, especially the second watch through without a doubt. So we're on the red carpet, um, one of the ladies interviews Maxine and is like, how does it feel to have the biggest movie in America? You know, that type of a question. Um, you've now sold your life rights about your life. You know, what are you going to do now? And yeah, it very much feels like Maxine's imagination in a way and, and makes me think like, okay, how much of this movie wasn't actually what happened in the movie and was supposed to be uh, Ty West is wanting us to think of this as just Maxine's perspective on things in some ways. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, and then, um, and then they replete, they, Maxine and her dad, we cut back to them and her dad and Maxine are like, they repeat the line that they've always said ever since they were kids together, you know, the, and Maxine, you know, of course, like, you know, a life you do not deserve that whole line. And then Maxine says to her dad, she says, you didn't fail me, daddy. Uh, you gave me just what I needed. And then it kind of pauses for a second and she says, divine intervention. And then it cuts for a moment and then the camera kind of pans down a little bit to her sawed off shotgun. You're like, oh shit, she's doing it. And then bam, blows his head to pieces. Fun scene. Uh, enjoyed that, of course, you know, cool practical effects. That was kind of funny, made me laugh, definitely. And then uh, we cut to one month later. So yeah, the ending there, like I said, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a crazy ending because that ending at the whole house in the Hollywood Hills, Hills, um, feels so different than the rest of the trilogy, Pearl and X, you know, it feels uh, obviously a, a bigger budget here with this movie clearly. Um, but it feels, just feels so different in the tone and reminds you what tone Ty West is going for here. I think a lot of people, and I talked about this a little bit in my spoiler free review, but I think a lot of people are going to misunderstand the tone of this movie in a sense, because it's supposed to be pretty silly. I mentioned some moments earlier where some of the dialogue is like stuff that you don't normally see in movies today in modern movies. It's, it's stuff that you see in movies from the eighties. Cause if you go back and watch movies from the eighties, like I do, you know, I watch a lot of movies from the eighties. You're like, Oh shit. I forgot that that, that people used to talk like this in movies. And that only just reminds you of the tone that Ty West is going for in this movie. He's going for this kind of silly 80s, you know, murder mystery cop movie with a tiny bit of a slasher approach to it. And the ending to this movie definitely fits into that. Do I love the ending to this movie? 
No, I, I wouldn't say I love the ending to this movie. I prefer way more of a slasher approach to this movie. I was really, really hoping that that's the direction this would go with the Night Stalker and Maxine and everything. Of course, it ended up being a little bit more of a murder mystery 80s cop movie, which I know I'm not going to say I hate. I don't because I, I grew up on movies like that, but not necessarily what I was wanting from this movie. But we'll get, a, get into more, uh, more of that in just a second as well. So to wrap things up, we cut to one month later now. And uh, Maxine, you know, up to her old tricks. She's doing some more cocaine in her trailer. Uh, but this time she looks different. She's like blonde hair. Even the director mentions it and says like, just like one of Hitchcock's blondes. Um, and, uh, but yeah, Maxine's looking at herself in the mirror like she's done many, many times in this trilogy, or at least an ex and uh, Maxine. And she says, you're a fucking movie star. She's also doing the drugs with a hundred dollar bill. So it's also kind of hinting to you that, okay, she, maybe she, you know, clearly she's, she's made it. You know what I'm saying? She walks back into the production and the production gives her a standing ovation. So obviously things have gone really, really well. They do a little bit of a moment of silence there for Molly Bennett, uh, the girl, the, the one who died. Um, and, um, and that, that moment's always funny. Like those moment of silence moments, moments can be, I mean, you've all been there. We've all been there, right? Like, they can be awkward sometimes, and they clearly try to portray that in this movie, how it's kind of like, let's do a moment of silence for Molly Bennett when you know they give you that. It's kind of funny how Ty, Le Ty West gives you that hint of like, I bet like half the people in this production don't really give a shit, nor they probably even met Molly. But, you know, so people are kind of looking at each other like, are we done yet? Is that long enough? How long should we go here? And even the director looks over at another person. I'm assuming like a producer or somebody. I don't know. And, uh, and then, yeah, they, they ended They're like, all right, everybody back to work, but kind of a little, little funny thing there, but yeah. And then, uh, the director says to Maxine, come over here, let's go check out your dream sequence with your fake head. And we, uh, they're looking at the monitor. They're looking at a scene where there's a bed and Maxine's prosthetic head is on the bed. Um, and the director asks Maxine says, so now that everyone knows your name, uh, any idea what do you, what you want to do next? And Maxine is just like, I just never want it to end. I do want to mention just for a second, I don't love Mia Goth's accent in both X and this movie. I'm not going to lie. I, I know that's probably not a uh, popular opinion, but I don't love her accent in both these movies. But Mia Goth, though, incredible in, in all three of the movies, though. Do not get me wrong. Like, incredible job. The accent at times is a little iffy, but anyways... Just made me randomly think about that for a second. But yeah, she says, I just never want it to end. And I will say, like, the then the ending, the, the kind of the ending song kicks in here. It's uh, Kim Carnes, Kim Carnes. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Betty Davis Eyes, a very iconic song, very popular song, a great song, incredible song. But I do feel like a little cliche. And that's probably what Ty West was going for, which fits into the movie which is supposed to be cliche at times, right? It's supposed to be an 80s murder mystery cop movie that is an 80s kind of cliche movie at times, like I said. But still, you know, I didn't love that song at the end for me. But yeah, and then the credits just roll and the camera pans out of the studio and overlooks Hollywood, which I thought was a cool moment. So, man, Maxine, 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 Maxine. This movie's been pretty divisive. I, I feel like uh, the most divisive movie in the trilogy, in my opinion. I, I loved X. Yes, absolutely loved X. One of my favorite slashers I've seen in a million years. You guys have heard of me talk about it at nauseum. Uh, love X. Love the characters in X. Love the tone of X. Love what they're going for. The slasher approach to X. Like I mentioned a second ago, I was really hoping in Maxine, that's the direction we were going to go with this movie. You know what I mean? But set in the 80s and set in Hollywood, that would have been incredible. More kills on some of the Hollywood sets, more like hide and go seek moments, more slasher vibes, you know, maybe a moment at the psycho set for a second. I was really hoping for more of that. Yeah, we got some of that with Leon's kill, but um, I'm not going to say I don't like this movie because I don't. I think this movie is really good. I really, really enjoyed this movie. Um, but was really hoping they would have taken that direction with it. 
But there you go, everybody. That is my spoiler review of Maxine. Very long video, so if you've made it this far, congratulations. You deserve a pee break and probably a glass of water or a uh, five shots of whatever the hell you like to drink. But yeah, appreciate you watching, everybody. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed Maxine overall, though, uh, despite you know some of the things I wish it would have done a little differently. But once again, the cast, incredible. Kevin Bacon's character, John, incredible. Everybody else in this movie, there's not a single performance in this movie that's not great. Mia Goth, once again, she's clearly a scream queen, um, one of the best to do it in decades, uh, and just really good in this movie. Love Mia Goth. Uh, but yeah, had a great time with Maxine. Regardless, I'll probably watch it again fairly soon. Um, but thanks, everybody, again, for watching. If you want some more content from me right now, then go ahead and check out one of these videos next to me. Make sure you subscribe, though, if uh, you don't want to miss any future videos um, coming up here. But uh, yep, thanks so much again, everybody. And I'll talk to you in the next one.